Good afternoon, everyone. It's Brian Robson here, the Medical Director at Healthcare Improvement Scotland. Uh, apologies for the slight delay in starting, and thanks very much for joining us on this, the second of our exciting QI Connect sessions for 2018, the 41st since we started, in fact. You will recall that QI Connect provides an opportunity for colleagues across health, social care, and beyond to learn from international leaders in the field of improvement, innovation, and integration. We've designed these sessions to be short, accessible, and recorded to allow access at a time that suits you. I'm now going to pass you over to Jennifer Graham, who will tell you a little bit more about the session. Good afternoon, Jennifer. Good afternoon, Brian, and good afternoon all to all of our Connectors. connectors. Um, so I just have a couple of quick housekeeping slides just to get started today. If you could please use the chat function that you see on the right hand side of your screen to communicate and I'll talk you through this in just a moment. And if you are having any technical difficulties throughout the session, such as not being able to hear the presenter speak or if you keep losing connection, then please message the event manager using the chat function or by um, pressing star zero on your telephone keypad. Uh, so these sessions are designed to be an interactive learning experience and we do encourage you to use the chat function to share any questions, comments or ideas throughout the talk and there will be an opportunity for Q&A at the end of the session. So um, if you can just click on the chat icon, you can see circled in red to the top right hand side of your screen and to the bottom right hand side of your screen, just type in your message and um, click send. And if you could make sure you send all your messages using the all participants option, that allows everyone to be able to see those and take part in the conversation. So we did promise that today's session was going to be fun and interactive, so this is the interactive part. Um, we're keen to find out where you're joining us from today, so if you could please select the annotation tool that's circled in, in red in the screen here, just the top left hand side. And then click on the arrow icon. <coughs> then click on the map. Well, Jennifer, it looks as though it's just you and me on this, <laughs> on this call. I know that's not true. We have <laughs> lots of participants there, but obviously I think there's maybe been a technical um, glitch there. It looks as though a technical glitch has, has broken in. Uh, so apologies to all our QI connectors. Uh, we happen to know that David Grayson is with us down in New Zealand, so kia ora, uh, David. It must be just uh, 5 a.m. Uh, down there. Uh, but we've also got colleagues from across the whole of the UK uh, and across uh, Europe and indeed from North America. And uh, oh, I see there's a few folks coming in. Louise has managed to break her way through the technology. Uh, oh, hi, Akeen. Uh, Akeen leads up the group in the Golden Jubilee uh, in Scotland. Wow, there you go. Now you're all coming uh, in. David. Now it's working. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so don't we just love that technology? And there's a uh, uh, Nirav uh, over there in New York. Uh, we've got uh, Amir over, looks like uh, BC, uh, Amir. You can correct me. Kathleen Ward uh, looks like BC as well. Um, you can correct me in the chat box. Oh, hi, hi Frank Federico from uh, IHI, a wonderful friend of, uh, of uh, Scotland uh, and much wider afield. Great to see you all on board. I see Simon McKenzie joining us from London. Afternoon, Professor. Uh, and uh, Molly uh, joining us from uh, the lower states, looks like uh, Texas, possibly into Arizona, now I'm guessing. Anyway, <laughs> I was just really just proving the fact that the technology is now working, Jennifer, so hey, well done everyone. So that wasn't the fun part, but it was, it was today. Uh, welcome Kathleen and all our Canadian pals uh, as well. Uh, thanks very much, Jennifer. And so good to see so many people uh, coming from all over the world. Um, David, you look pretty far away down there, but you feel very close to us on today's call. So thanks again for all your support uh, for QI Connect. And QI Connect now reaches almost 700 uh, organizations that have signed up uh, over the, the sessions for uh, QI Connect, which is amazing. And we always love this part of the, the, the session where we start to go into uh, a bit of a competition just to keep your fingers on the buzzers again. So again, we're going to be using the 
um, the arrow function. And uh, we have a new country joining us today for the very first time. Uh, we, we currently have um, a huge number of countries. Jennifer, we're talking 54 countries now. That's right. Uh, so 54 countries joining QI Connect. And I'm going to give you the name of the, the uh, new, uh, the first, uh, there's Nirav joining us from America. But the, the, the new country that's joined us today, I'm going to read out their name and you're going to fingers on the buzzer and we'll try and get your arrow on the new country. And the new country is South Africa. Wow, Steph, oh, that was quick. No, it, it looked like Stephen or Stefan. Uh, Stephen or Stefan, could you just come into the uh, chat box? That was that was very quick for us there. Uh, Stefan Sieber, I think. Uh, was it you, Stefan? You can tell us in the in the chat box. Uh, Stefan Sieber is a clinical senior lecturer in rheumatology at the University of Glasgow. We'll do a quick rerun of the video on that, but Stefan, if you can let us know if you put your your uh, arrow in that box by just chatting into the chat box. Uh, and of course, the wonderful prize for that is indeed a QI Connect mug, the much sought after, internationally recognized QI Connect mug. And we'll make sure that that gets to Stefan today. And well done to everybody else for recognizing uh, the, uh, the South African flag. 54 countries, pretty impressive. Uh, for you QI connectors. And it's always a wonderful part of the session where we run through now 22 s slides of your wonderful logos from across the 54 countries. We're absolutely delighted to welcome everyone uh, to today's uh, QI Connect uh, session and to be able to uh, share your logos widely. And we're always delighted, of course, that we have uh, all of NHS Scotland uh, signed up and joining on uh, QI Connect, and we saw earlier from uh, Akeen over the Golden Jubilee, uh, a great supporter of uh, QI Connect. So good to see so many uh, uh, organisations there. And we've actually today uh, been joined by 18 new organisations who've joined us just for today's session. Uh, great to see folks from the UK, uh, from the United States, uh, the South African National Department of Health have joined us uh, today. Uh, we have the European Junior, Junior Doctors uh, Association from uh, Sweden. Uh, we have the Bloemfontein University Hospital in South Africa. Uh, we have the University Hospital Wishaw, Wood End Hospital in uh, Aberdeen. And uh, wonderful uh, friends now from the Global Brain Health Institute in Ireland, uh, the Northwell Health in New York, uh, USA. I mean, Jennifer, that's an amazing array of individuals that join QI Connect to learn and share. Uh, so great to see you all. And we always shout out the, the universities. Uh, we've always had a great following from the universities. We now have 62 universities uh, joining us from across the world. And a new university for the first time today is McGill University in Montreal in Canada. Uh, so a big shout out and thank you for joining us uh, from uh, McGill. And uh, Ko Awatea down in New Zealand told us from the very first uh, QI Connect uh, episode uh, some four years or so ago that it was such a great um, uh, asset to have these sessions recorded. So just to remind everyone that the recordings are available, we have a full four year back catalogue uh, freely available on the Healthcare Improvement Scotland website and also on our YouTube channel. Uh, they are there to be le to learn and learn and learn again. And a big shout out to our friends at the International Society for Quality in Healthcare, ISQA, and their wonderful fellowship program, who again, for the last four years, have used uh, QI Connect resources as a resource for the fellowship program. So we're absolutely delighted with that. And we announced last year uh, that we have a, a, a new partnership with the Health Foundation and NHS Improvement. The Health Foundation is, of course, the uh, UK charitable organization seeking to drive improvement in health and social care uh, across the UK and beyond. And the Q community uh, is a, a growing community of UK uh, improvers uh, who have joined a QI Connect. And then just to finish off this, this introduction, the small but perfectly formed QI Connect team. You've heard from Jennifer and obviously from me. Uh, Michelle has just left the, the studio with her coughing at the moment. Big shout out to Michelle. 
Uh, Jeff is with us, who works with us on registration and all the resources, and Carmen, who also works in, in certification, making sure and uh, uh, making sure that we've got the database up to date and making sure you get all of your certificates on time. Alex is taking a well-earned break today from uh, from QI Connect. Uh, she's on leave, uh, and uh, but we're very keen, as you know, on ensuring that we reach all of our uh, colleagues via Twitter. And we'll introduce you to Ale um, uh, Alistair just shortly, but Alistair is our key questioner today, an information consultant with Public Health Intelligence in uh, National Services Scotland. Uh, I see that we've claimed you as Healthcare Improvement Scotland, Alistair, uh, for this slide, but National Services Scotland, we work very closely uh, together. We'll hear more from Alistair just in a moment. Uh, the HIS QI Connect uh, is, an act, is an active uh, uh, place to tweet, so we encourage people to tweet throughout the whole of today's uh, episode. So we're really pleased to have so many of you uh, with us today. And now that brings us on to uh, today, and you've already had a sneak preview via the technology, but I'm absolutely delighted that our QI Connect speaker today brings a huge breadth of experience in social determinants of health, in healthcare safety and improvement, and wider health research. Uh, he's a graduate of Harvard College and Yale Medical School and a board certified internal medicine physician. Nirav Shah is the immediate past uh, uh, senior vice president and chief operating officer for Kaiser Permanente in Southern California and is now moving to Stanford University School of Medicine, and we'll hear more about that uh, shortly. However, I'm absolutely delighted to say that Nirav is also a very good friend of Scotland and is currently serving on our expert panel for our new digital health and care strategy uh, for Scotland. So we're really looking forward to a very exciting QI Connect session, and uh, I'd like to say good afternoon to Nirav. Thank you so much, Brian. I'm so excited to be here and join this international group. I'll jump right in, and I'll start with the story. Jess Jacobs, the head of innovation at a large health insurance company, blogs about her care experience with two rare diseases. Jess is trained as a Greenbelt Six Sigma, so she would write about a 12-hour wait in the ER emergency room as having 7% process cycle efficiency. Over the course of a year, she documented 56 outpatient doctor visits, of which 29% were useful, 20 visits to the ER, and 54 days as an inpatient across nine hospital admissions. Her calculations showed that only 0.08% of that time was spent treating her conditions. For her, time saved equates to quality. Speed is quality. And in healthcare, we deliver very little quality when defined by a metric that matters to our patients, patient time. How did we get here? Well, I'd like to say that at least in the United States, we have a perfectly designed $3 trillion healthcare delivery system. It's perfectly designed to deliver more and more health care, not more health. What do people want? Health, not health care. And we know why we got here. The incentives are wrong. Costs don't reflect the value of services. Prevention is not as sexy as the Da Vinci robot. So we buy new gadgets rather than invest in things like water fluoridation. And ultimately, our systems drive more care rather than deliver more health. But let me back up a bit. How did we get here? In the early 1900s, life became very complicated. The example I like to use is the internal combustion engine. There are many parts. I can't explain how they interact, but oil and air go in and mix, and thrust and exhaust are created. Pistons, rotors, turbines all work together in very predictable ways to turn chemical energy into mechanical energy. This is complicated, 
but a complicated system can be broken down in tidy, deterministic relationships. So the Industrial Revolution was a reflection of life getting complicated, and folks like Henry Ford took a reductionist approach to break down every action into its components and optimize each action using standardized parts. His assembly line took a car that used to take three days to make by a master builder who had years of apprenticeship, down to 93 minutes by replaceable and lower cost line workers. His management innovation was a top-down hierarchical approach where managers were paid to think and line workers were paid to do. The big secret here is that standardization was innovation, that variation is the enemy, and that quality is measured by the speed of the assembly line. I'll say that again because it's so important. In complicated systems, standardization results in innovation, like interchangeable wheels, the front to the back, the left to the right, and quality is measured by speed. The power of standardization in healthcare is undervalued. Let me give you an example. The average patient who needs an elective hip replacement surgery stays in the hospital perhaps three days to five days. This is because surgeons want to monitor healing, and the easiest way for them is to have all their patients in one unit. The system was created by and optimized for surgeons, not by or for patients. At innovative health systems, however, we found that in co-designing the optimal journey for patients requiring hip replacement, up to half our patients can go home the same day as surgery. How do you achieve a zero-day stay in the hospital? It requires standard workflows that are agreed upon by the entire team caring for the patient. Before surgery, a care coordinator educates the patient and the family about what to expect. Before surgery, a physical therapist visits the home, rolls up the rugs, moves the bed to the ground floor, and reinforces the education. Before surgery, a pharmacist goes over medication the cha changes the patient will need, if any. Other care team members come by to deliver the properly si uh, sized walkers. Not only do these actions set expectations for a home recovery, but they also give the patient the chance to become acquainted with and develop trust in the care team. On the day of the surgery, orthopedic surgeons perform the surgery from an anterior approach. While this may be more difficult for them to learn initially, it greatly reduces the pain of surgery and recovery, allowing the patient to walk immediately after the operation. Anesthesia uses a standardized cocktail and spinal block, resulting in optimal pain control. Further, Orthopedic surgeons select from a small, predetermined set of standardized devices. You're not allowed 20 devices based on what the rep has shown in your office. You're allowed small, medium, large, maybe a few more. And as a result, nurses and other members of the team only have to learn to handle a few devices. And that expertise with fewer devices, we've determined, decreases the rate of complications and infections. After surgery and a meal in the recovery area, the patient demonstrates that they can get dressed and safely walk 30 feet, eat a meal, and then go home. That night, we've scripted the surgeons to call, Mrs. Jones, I'm not going to be able to sleep unless you're able to sleep, which delights the patient and reassures her. The next morning, you can set your watch. A physical therapist arrives at the house at 9 a.m., ready to begin the first of six in-home physical therapy sessions. The care coordinator calls to check in and make certain the patient has a phone number for any questions or concerns. At 10 a.m., a night nurse arrives to take vitals. At noon, a physician's assistant reviews the electronic health record of both the PA and the nurse visit and if necessary, makes any changes to the care regimen. 3 p.m., physical therapy in the home again, and that pattern repeats. Two weeks later, the patient visits the surgeon in the clinic, not the hospital, which closes the loop. Throughout the process, 
reliable, excellent care with multiple safety nets is provided in a psychologically safe environment where it's everyone's job to speak up. And team members are collectively responsible for responding to patient needs and ensuring the best clinical outcome. If the patient doesn't feel safe and doesn't know what to expect, they'll go to the emergency room where they may be admitted to the hospital. Most important, every workflow is created for and with patients in mind. This is a very definition of patient-centered care. It requires not just cooperation, but true interdependence between the members of the care team, the patient and the family, and the community. We have time for a little quiz. What is the hospital-acquired infection rate for a zero-day stay in the hospital? Zero, <laughs> trick question. What are the visiting hours at home? Generous. And how about the quality of the food? Well, we hope it's better than at the hospital. And the satisfaction scores patients give their experience in their own homes? Outstanding. And how much quality time do we give back to patients so they can recover in the comfort of their own homes, surrounded by family far from the constant din of the hospital? More than three days. While perhaps the most important thing to achieve these high quality, patient-centered results is standardization, co-design templates and detailed playbooks for every team member, an important part of the work is customization. The mistake we too often make in medicine is that we start with customization. Every patient is unique. Every patient has nuances that are meaningful. While this is true, starting with what's common creates considerable opportunities to raise the bar to the top of the evidence-based hierarchy. And on top of standardization, we add customization to the important preferences and expectations of the patient and family, to the local needs of the surgical and clinical care teams. And as we customize, we never lose sight of the collective needs of the patient, family, and care team. These collective needs are line of sight to every team member as they iterate to improve the program. With every optimization, also consider other de-optimizations that might be created for someone else. That's why it takes many months for these seemingly simple workflows to be developed. We must go slow to eventually go fast. And incidentally, one of the greatest satisfiers for the orthopedic surgeons is they no longer have to round in the hospital in the morning, a positive externality we didn't initially think of. So standardization is innovation, and it allows for mass customization, improving the velocity of care. And velocity or speed is a little heralded measure of quality when you're also monitoring balancing metrics, such as readmission rates, infection, mortality, and other hard outcomes. By now you're saying, Nirav, you're on the wrong WebEx. The orthopedic surgeons are meeting on another number. But I'm telling this story because there are immense opportunities to get patient-centered, quality-driven, triple aim results if we keep a laser-like focus on metrics that matter. Measure the right thing to get the right results. Let me give you one more example. The average patient with declining kidney function and ultimately end-stage renal disease has what I like to call a catastrophic start to hemodialysis. What generally happens is as kidney function declines, people get sicker and sicker. They may not take medications to optimally slow the progression of renal disease. They are not well educated on options such as peritoneal dialysis, preemptive kidney transplant. They may be in denial about their disease progression. And when the day finally comes on, they end up feeling very sick until they show up in the emergency room and require emergent dialysis with a large catheter stuck in their neck, a few days in the hospital, and maybe even the intensive care unit, 
and then long-term hemodialysis until they get a kidney, which in California can take a decade because of the wait list. That's our standard of care. However, there is something we call an optimal start to dialysis, which happens not enough. After the first abnormal blood test, a patient and their family is educated about progression of kidney disease. They may even elect to get a preemptive kidney transplant before needing dialysis. An arteriovenous fistula may be placed in advance as an outpatient, so they don't need a catheter in their neck. A patient may elect to learn about home peritoneal dialysis, and a start date to dialysis is set before a patient feels sick so that they don't need to be in the hospital. You see, we know based on serial blood tests how fast a patient is progressing to kidney failure. The difference with an optimal start, however, is that we act on that information. That calculating when patient education, surgical dialysis access, medication optimization, all of these things must happen. And what is the difference between a catastrophic start and an optimal start? Well, certainly in terms of patient outcomes, given the risks associated with an emergency catheter placed in a hospital and an ICU stay, an optimal start is certainly what every patient would want for themselves. And what about time saved? Hemodialysis means you have to drive to a center, get hooked up to a machine, and wait three hours several times a week staring into space or watching TV, feeling sick before each treatment. Home peritoneal dialysis means you can hook yourself up at home for uh, overnight even, as you sleep perhaps, uh, on your schedule, surrounded by family, without commuting or dealing with the feeling of sickness and, and really owning your own health. And how about the cost differences? In the first six months, an optimal start versus a catastrophic start saves tens of thousands of dollars. So the key metric is to measure optimal start rates, a patient-centered metric that combines numerous process and outcome measures into one. You can only improve your optimal start rate if your entire healthcare system actually performs as a system, from early diagnosis, quick and appropriate referral to specialists, careful tracking of disease progression, patient education that is understood, coordination with surgery teams, transplant teams, scheduling to make all of this occur as planned. If your system breaks down anywhere, the combined metric will quickly deteriorate. You only get triple aim results because you measure what matters. Now let's shift from the complicated 20th century to the 21st century. The 21st century is not just complicated, it's complex. What is complex? In complex systems, the number of interactions between the components is increases exponentially. It's not a gear that turns and makes another gear turn. It's that single rogue trader in the UK who can throw the whole world's stock markets into turmoil. It's that butterfly in Brazil who can cause a tornado in Texas. It's very complex, like trying to get on a WebEx from around the world. The key lesson is solutions to address complicated systems don't work when things are complex. In his book, Team of Teams, General Stanley McChrystal describes how he created the Joint Special Operations Task Force to beat back Al-Qaeda. Before 9-1-1, we had many signals of something big happening that would include using airplanes as bombs and many other details of the perpetrators and their plans. But the FBI, CIA, and others didn't share. General McChrystal's solution was to embrace radical transparency. All of the data from every agency available in real time to everyone, not siloed, not need to know, and hand in hand with the radical transparency you must flatten the hierarchy and empower the front lines. What does this mean? For the Joint Task Force, a low-level drone operator might see a fuzzy signal on the monitor, and given her access to all the other data, push the button to order a full-on airstrike with millions of dollars of jets and hundreds of troops mobilized to obliterate the enemy. General McChrystal created a psychologically safe environment with a shared belief held by members of the team 
that the group was a safe place to take risks without the 17 levels of approval needed. They could act with speed and precision, leveraging shared assets to create a level of consciousness and agility across the entire enterprise. General McChrystal called this shared consciousness and empowered execution. In our complex reality, that shared consciousness and empowered execution is what we need in healthcare. Only then will we be able to get to the next order of magnitude of improvement. You know, Kaiser Permanente has embraced these concepts. Today in America, colorectal cancer, five-year survival is 65%. But for Kaiser members, it's 80% survival at five years. And there are plans to have the death rate in the next three years. Here's a real example. The receptionist who's checking Mrs. Hernandez in for a routine primary care appointment gets an alert saying Mrs. Hernandez is overdue for her colonoscopy. He makes the effort to counsel her about it and does manage to schedule it. During the colonoscopy, a high-grade polyp is found and removed. A week later, the hospital CEO stops by to visit the receptionist, and in a public ceremony, the receptionist gets a pin saying, I saved a life. This is the magic. Frontline colleagues, empowered by actionable data in a psychologically safe environment, making decisions and reconnecting with purpose and meaning in their job. I can bet you that every receptionist is going to get every patient signed up for a colonoscopy after that. And by the way, Henry Ford was wrong. Managers should not only be paid to think and line workers only paid to do. So health systems that embrace radical transparency have incredible outcomes. Team members, which even include the receptionist, housekeeping, food services, want to do the right thing. They just need actionable data. And let's talk some more about the power of radical transparency. You know, when I was in New York as Commissioner of Health, Dr. Don Berwick told me that we should liberate the data with a website like healthdata.gov. And I've seen in the chat you've already shared the health.data.ny.gov website. The very first data set my lawyers allowed me to release on that, data, on that website was the most boring data there is. That is the most uncontroversial data in our servers. We published the weekly care home bed census data. That means how many people are in the beds in all the nursing homes across New York State. I was very excited. I put out a big press release. I told everyone who would listen, and about a month later, Hurricane Irene hit New York, requiring thousands of patients to be evacuated from Long Island. Luckily, our boring heads in beds data helped nursing home care home operators move patients out of harm's way on their own over that weekend without help from the government. After that, more controversial data were released and otherwise controversial decisions were made supported by the data. For example, we found that for every $1 invested in water fluoridation, Medicaid, which is the insurance program for poor people, saved $14 in children's dental bills. So water fluoridation is Medicaid's responsibility. That for every dollar invested in the Nurse Family Partnership Program, wherein nurses visit a first-time mom on Medicaid every month through pregnancy, several dollars were saved, not to mention improved outcomes for moms and their children. So $20 million was invested in Nurse Family Partnership. And at that time, $1 billion in New York State was being spent by Medicaid on 28,724 recipients who were either homeless or stuck in care homes and didn't need to be there. The state was spending $755 a day for an inpatient hospital stay, $437 a day for inpatient psychiatry, 
$280 a day for a care home, $129 a day for jail, $68 a day for a homeless shelter, versus $47 a day in supportive housing. So we invested $388 million in supportive housing to save a billion dollars. Housing is healthcare. Ultimately, we saved $4.6 billion for Medicaid that first year, and over the next three years rocketed from 49th in quality from among the 50 states of the United States up to 22nd. I think the lesson here is transparency leads to positive externalities, which you can't design for in complex systems, and that will help align the incentives and correct problems in ways that cannot be planned or mandated. I told you about that 80% colorectal cancer survival rate at Kaiser Permanente. How are they closing that gap? That gets beyond the complicated into the complex, and to get there, we have to redefine what counts as healthcare. We started by looking at the 1% of Kaiser Permanente members responsible for over one quarter of Kaiser Permanente's over, overall cost. On average, those 1% accounted for $98,000 of care each on average in 2015. And who are these folks? Well, first, in co-design workshops with them, they told us they want to be referred to as the vital few rather than the super utilizers or 1%. But you know the vital few. They have multiple chronic conditions, multiple admissions. In our sample, 78% have hypertension, two-thirds have diabetes, half have kidney disease, not to mention many with mental health and substance abuse and other challenges. You know, an average patient sees 60 different clinical staff during a hospital stay, yet this isn't helping the vital few. At home, they are called by their, their hypertension case manager, their diabetes case manager, and likely one or two other disease-specific case managers, sometimes you know, with contradictory advice. Sidebar, if anyone knows a whole person case manager, I'm hiring. So we started a phone call the vital few. Two-thirds answered the phone, half agreed to be screened, and the very first woman we called was an older woman who let me share her story, living with two dogs in a walk-up apartment in a suburb of Los Angeles, has two steps up to her apartment, and she'd been falling on those two steps for the last few months, terrified that she'd have to move lose her social support, and, and didn't know what to do, couldn't sleep at night. All we did was connect her to a tenants' rights association, which installed a $60 handrail. No need to move. We gave her a sense of agency to take care of herself once again, and we made the big step of entering her world rather than the traditional approach of making her enter ours. In calling over 5,000 patients today, we found few surprises. Highest needs include caregiver support, food and financial support. Digging deeper, we found that prediabetes is associated with food insecurity, that the Pareto principle applies not only to costs, but also to community partners and agencies. You know, 10% of the community partners and agencies in our database were responsible for 90% of the benefit that our patients accrued that 27% of the resources harm patients. If we refer someone to a certain food bank where the weight is ours, the referral can cause despair. Versus to another food bank which treats people with dignity and meets their needs, it makes a big difference. In Bakersfield, California, 40% of people who reported unmet social needs report housing insecurity, yet there are no supportive housing providers in the county. Maybe our first collective dollar across the hospitals should not go to the food bank creating despair, but that throws a nice gala at $1,000 a place, but to together build supportive housing. We must redefine what counts as healthcare and make open choices about how we do that. Today, one in six people in America go to bed hungry, yet less than half are en uh, enrolled in reduced cost food benefits. Whose job it is, is it to enroll patients in these benefits? It's my job. It's all of our jobs. As we examined the vital few further, we started a half dozen randomized controlled trials. For example, you'd assume that a, a, assigning patient navigators to these 
uh, super utilizers will decrease total cost of care, perhaps reduce readmissions, utilization, and so forth. In fact, we saw a 60% decrease in admissions and huge effect sizes in most other measures. But thank goodness we did a randomized control trial. We saw similar decreases in the control group, hence we've abandoned the use of navigators in such patients for now. Another 1,600-person RCT that com uh, completed recently has home-based assessments of vulnerable patients. We're waiting for a year's follow-up, but so far there's no effect of home-based evaluations on any number of important parameters, and again, thank God we randomized. Where am I going with this? We desperately need to match our care resource in intensity to patient complexity, but have been patently unable to do so. So if you see this slide, the top red box is the 1%, and the bottom are the uh, lower f uh, cost folks. And on the right are the inten interventions we should make. So for example, with Using telehealth or using the telephone for visits instead of in-clinic visits is relatively low cost, which to date has often been a story of additional supply driving additional demand. It's so easy to get a primary care doctor on the phone, things you normally wouldn't have gone in for, you're going to call in for. So consider also the PACE program or the program of all-inclusive care for the elderly. $30,000 a person, very expensive, highly targeted touch programs. When we build these things, it's very hard because we let everyone else into these highly targeted touch programs, people who don't have an RO, a return on investment. And so these programs blow up. We as a society have had real challenges targeting models of care to those who would best benefit, using rigorous criteria to study and evaluate, and ultimately disseminate such programs. And most important will be the low-cost programs that leverage existing resources in other sectors, creating efficiencies and low-cost but big wins. The social needs screening program I described is one example. <clears throat> Earlier, I spoke with you about Jess, whose calculations showed that less than one-tenth of 1% one of the time she spent getting care was actually spent treating her condition. Over a year, she spent 54 days in the hospital, nearly two months of her life waiting instead of healing. Maybe health systems should be rated on how much time they give back to patients, how many days at home per year they achieve for people like Jess. A tragic footnote about Jess. She died at the age of 29. She has no more time. So I hope that you believe, as I do, that speed is quality, that standardization is innovation, and that we need to give folks in our communities more of what they want and need from us, time. In order to get there, we need to embrace radical transparency and completely redefine what counts as healthcare. Thank you. Nirav, thank you so much, and it was great to have uh, Jess's story and the other stories to orientate us throughout your whole talk. The chat box has gone wild, and we'll come to that just in a moment. But I would like to just uh, say uh, welcome to Alistair Philp, uh, Information Consultant, uh, actually at NHS uh, National Services Scotland. Uh, good afternoon, Alistair. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Alistair, you have a, let me just introduce you to Nirav. Hi there, Alistair. And just to oh. invite you to uh, go with your first question. Thanks, Alistair. Yeah, thanks very much for such a captivating and uh, provocative uh, presentation. Um, I guess my, my question uh, is the following. It's, it's about what would be, for you, the most unexpected source of resistance when you are testing these standardization approaches? And what changes did you need to make to address these? And I'm interested in uh, the sort of concepts of integrity of the approach versus the fidelity, which is a distinction that the Carnegie Foundation have drawn in terms of quality improvement in education. So trying to find out what the 
the key aspects of the approach are rather than making everybody follow a recipe. And I think that that chimes in with quite a lot of the questions in the, in the chat box. Yeah, so the, that's the important question, and thank you for asking that. You know, with the zero-day HIP protocol, we knew what to do on day one, right? We knew exactly what to do. It's a standard protocol. You need high-quality home care. You need reliable care. You need A, B, C, D, E, F, G to happen. And yet, if we had just told everyone this is what's going to happen, we wouldn't have had surgeons trusting the system to send patients home the same day. They would say, my patients are sicker, my patients are more complex, your data are wrong, you know, the, the reaction everyone has. But when we co-designed with patients and surgeons, then they came up with the nuances that are very important to the success of the program in their local microenvironment. So we came with food, two meetings that they already had, and said, here's an idea, what do you think of it? And let us work together to figure out how this works here. And so they had very important 20% customization on top of the 80% standardization that allowed them to make the program theirs as opposed to ours imposed on them. Their thumbprints were on the plan. It was the anesthesia plan. It was the orthopedic surgeon plan. It was the home care plan for each of the 15 local areas. That means we do not have to look over their shoulders to see if it's working. That means they will automatically collect the data and make sure that the one surgeon who doesn't want to do this because his patients are sicker and he knows best and he's been doing it 30 years this way gets talked to by colleagues and shown the data saying, look, our patients have the same or better outcomes and they're actually recovering at home. It's good for them. It's good for the system. It's a triple aim win. We don't have to do all of that. So we had to go very slow because there was lots of resistance at every step of the data, of the integrity of the processes, of the reliability of the care coordinators, and on and on and on. But once you've built that trust, they can do it on their own. And so the fidelity is important, but we, we always confuse integrity versus fidelity. There has to be both. You have to be the high fidelity to the local conditions with integrity to the outcomes you achieve overall as a system. Nara, thank you very much. Alistair, thank you very much indeed for that. And there's been a whole series of uh, comments in the chat box uh, around the data and how we use data and intelligence uh, and, and the, the importance of transparency. Uh, we have uh, Simon Edgar, who's the Director of Medical Education at NHS Lothian, and he's saying, Nara, um, how does transparency land with cl clinicians, patients, and regulators in your experience? And you saw the reference to uh, ny.gov.data, uh, uh, maybe even using that your experience in New York yeah. that you've told us about previously. So, so this is my personal opinion. I think that in this Twitter world where the news cycle is, you know, minutes, not hours or days or weeks, the only answer that will boil up to the top for regulators, no matter what the problem, will be let's demand more transparency <laughs> because it shifts the blame off of them to fix the problem and forces more transparency to all the different players. So we're going to be in a very transparent world compared to where we are today in a very short period of time because that will be, no matter what the question, transparency will be the answer. In New York, when one of the first things I saw was that 23% of cardiac catheterizations were inappropriate according to American Heart Association guidelines. They were putting balloons and stents in the coronary arteries of patients with a 20% blockage. This is according to their own data. So I published every doctor's name with every doctor's inappropriate rate on our website. You can go there today and still see it. And of course, I got short of death threats. I got the threats that, Nirav, your data are wrong. My patients are sicker. You're going to scare patients away. You're going to lead to adverse selection and on and on and on. And the reality was, I can tell you that no patient with chest pain went to our website to see the inappropriate rate of their doctor. I can tell you that doctors self saw their own data, and thankfully some retired who were in the high 80s and 90s. Administrators looked at the data and said, what's going on here? And the vast majority of clinicians improved their quality of care. And now, after 18 months actually, the inappropriate rate went from 23% to 8 percent, 
while the cath labs remained full of patients who were underserved minorities who weren't getting the care they needed, they found them and filled up the cath labs and kept the volume up. So transparency, if you can wear the Kevlar for the news cycle or two, um, you can make huge strides. And I can tell you 10 more stories along those lines just from healthdata.ny.gov, but it is going to be the answer to just about everything from a regulator perspective, and um, it also aligns the incentives in ways that you can't dictate or mandate or create pay for performance or other incentives to, to try to get to. Wonderful, Nira. Thanks very much. And I can see folk are starting to look where you can buy Kevlar. Everyone seems in this call seems to be keen to uh, democratize that data and increase uh, transparency. Uh, just some great comments in the chat box here. Uh, Arvind Varaya has been commenting all the way through. Uh, he's a, the, our national clinical lead for the pa patient safety program in medicines and a physician in, in Lothian. Uh, he said the talk has been wonderful. Thanks very much, Nirav. Nelson Kennedy, who is the information uh, consultant at uh, uh, Public Health and Intelligence here in Scotland. Um, Nelson's been following and chatting, but he's asking where digital technologies are helping resolve some of the issues that you mentioned. You know, digital technologies, I think we think of it as the, gold, uh, as the silver bullet, the, the thing that's going to solve everything. And the opportunity with boring technology like telephones is incredible. Today, 25% of all primary care visits in Kaiser, Southern California, are done over the telephone, right? Things, you, you put two telephone visits in the slot for one in-person visit. It gives the doctor time. Patients don't have to fight for uh, parking or go through Los Angeles traffic. Everyone wins. And it's just a telephone. It doesn't need video. It doesn't need, what's the right amount for the telephone? I think when you're an established patient, it may be 50% of, of visits by telephone or even higher. Video visits are taking over for psychiatry, where once you've got an in-person uh, person, uh, established relationship, again, video, you can see each other's faces, makes it, makes it a great visit. Um, similarly, putting iPhones in the hands of nurses who go to the home means real-time communication with physicians. Very cheap technology, and yet, all those transition problems are immediately resolved because otherwise the answer for the home health nurse who's worried about something is to send the patient to A&E, not to, uh, because they will never reach a doctor otherwise. So technology is already transforming established workflows. The next level of transformation will be things like, how do we get every patient dialysis at home? That's what Google and Apple and others will do because it will be highly disruptive to the Davidas and Fresenius's and established companies and workflows of the world. There are, All of this is my opinion, by the way. This is just more. Well, it seems to be opinion that, that's shared by many on the call. Uh, so we can see that from the chat box also. Uh, folks, we're going to run over just by a few moments, uh, but I'd like to just ask uh, just a little couple of questions more. Um, uh, Joseph Dahin, who is a Scottish Clinical Leadership Fellow here, International Leadership Fellow here with Healthcare Improvement Scotland and NHS Lothian, and is now back in his native Montreal, and has actually just been appointed as the Medical Director for Quality Evaluation, Performance and Ethics uh, over in Montreal in his hospital system. Congratulations, Joseph. Joseph's been commenting uh, throughout the talk, but one of the things that he raised was a recent uh, JAMA article um, now, Rav, you may be, avail uh, may be familiar with around how value-based Medicare payments exacerbate health care disparities. And I guess he's just got a, a, a question for you around how do we make sure that pay-for-performance systems don't skew us uh, away from the people that we should be concentrating on? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, of, you know, I, I, I think pay-for-performance has largely been, uh, it, it hasn't been a slam dunk. And that's often because the money gets to the system, it doesn't get to the doctors. It doesn't tie individual or team-based behaviors to dollars. And frankly, um, you know, systems that are much closer to getting incentives aligned at the individual provider and team level payment to quality outcomes do tend to work better uh, than those pay-for-performance mega programs. Um, the, the disparities issue is a very interesting one. And so the example I'll give you is, you know, when you hit 90% hypertension control rates among all patients with high blood pressure across Kaiser Permanente, 
the last 10% are the complex patients, the, are the disparities issues. And so what got you to 90% is going to be fundamentally different that gets you the next 3, 5, 7, 10%. It's going to be installing the handrail that lets you give the patient the chance to take her medications again that gets you from 90 to 93%. And so that focus and segmentation of the data is going to be really important. Segmenting the patients, not based on just clinical state or organ system, but understanding all the different lenses you can look through at a patient and understanding what are the levers you can pull from a social determinants perspective, from a clinical perspective, and coordinate all of those to really drive the last 5 10% that you need. So I agree, we, you know, for the vast majority of America who's performing at 40% on a given metric, getting from 40% to 90% is a very different challenge than when systems of healthcare like Intermountain, like Geisinger, like uh, Kaiser, like NHS, their, their challenges and work is going to be very different in my opinion. Yeah, great, great point. Thanks very much for that. And te technology and its role in all of this seems to be coming up a lot in the in the chat box. And it's great to have Steve Gilbert, uh, who was previously the national clinical lead for chronic pain here in Healthcare Improvement Scotland, is now down in Townsville, Australia. Uh, Steve was uh, calling out the uh, team of teams approach that he's uh, using down there in creating video conferencing uh, using the Project Echo. Uh, approach uh, for chronic pain. So a big shout out to Steve down in Australia, uh, and also to our colleagues in in, um, in Sweden, uh, and indeed in Norway. Uh, we've got Bjorn Hansel on the on the call, who's the medical director of Junior Doctor Sweden, and he, he shares in the chat box that they've got this public uh, innovation uh, uh, organisation called Experio Lab, and they're doing a lot of service redesign. Um, uh, models to improve healthcare and move it closer to people's needs. So many of the folk on the call are really uh, in, in the field that you're talking about, uh, Nirav. I'd like to just jump to a question here from uh, Andrew Winter, who's the eHealth lead uh, here in Glasgow, actually, um, uh, the eHealth clinical lead here uh, and a consultant physician. Uh, Andrew asked a series of questions, but one of them was, uh, can we ask you about the impact of Amazon or Berkshire Hathaway announcement that they are going to enter healthcare market to provide a more efficient care? Uh, what do you think those sorts of um, uh, services might uh, provide differently? Well, I'm speaking with them next week, so I can't tell you yet uh, what, what they're <laughs> going to do. I don't know that they know what they're going to do, but I think what it shows is everyone is fed up and that the healthcare delivery system hasn't given the solutions that folks feel we need when in the United States 18% of GDP goes toward healthcare and we're not getting the outcome we need. So there's a, there, what this to me is a signal that we need radically different solutions. And so I'm answering that by th looking at things like what would it take to get every patient dialyzed at home? What would it take to fundamentally flip the model of care? And, and allow artificial intelligence, predictive analytics, and other technologies to sub-segment our data, provide the segmentation that leads to standardized treatment, but then also allows for the personalization that only the clinician can do in terms of talking to the patient, understanding preferences, formulating care plans in partnership with the patient, giving pa the physicians more time back to care for patients rather than bill for patients. So I think that, you know, I, I don't think, I, I actually don't, I know they don't know necessarily where they're going with it, but it's a strong signal that uh, whatever Amazon does, whatever CVS does, all of these partners entering into healthcare means that we're not going to be the masters of the domain anymore as clinicians unless we step up and partner and deliver what we need as healthcare. Nirav, thank you so much. We've come to the end of our time, uh, Nirav, and I'd just like to thank you on behalf of uh, all the QI connectors that joined. The chat box was absolutely full. Many of them commented on the, on the, the, the storytelling that you used, a very powerful story uh, of Jess and others. Uh, a big thank you and shout out uh, for uh, your uh, contribution today. Thank you very much indeed. We are absolutely delighted to say that our next speaker on QI Connect in a month's time will be Al Mully. Uh, Al moved from Harvard up to uh, Dartmouth Institute to the Geisel School of Medicine. Uh, he's a world leader in the field of shared decision making 
uh, involving communities in care uh, and changing the way that we think about care. So building on many of the aspects that Nirav uh, talked about today. So please join us for that call. Uh, it's going to be an absolute cracker. And amongst the, it's going to be amongst a great series of absolute crackers for 2018. Uh, wonderful speakers. Uh, there's the lineup. You've seen it before. I want to shout out a big shout out to uh, to Brenny Brown. Uh, Brenny Brown is, is, uh, has confirmed now that she'll be speaking on QI Connect on the 30th of August. You'll remember that Brenny was affected uh, by the uh, by the uh, the hurricane. Uh, in uh, Houston uh, last year, uh, but delighted to say that's the lineup for this year. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Big shout out to everyone here in the studio for sticking with us. And uh, everyone remember, please, we're on uh, uh, Twitter. Uh, we will be uh, tweeting before and after every session. Please keep the, the tweets up. Uh, and nothing more for me to say than have a great day wherever you are all over the world. Thanks very much. <laughs>